Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and very, very warm welcome to our um, seminar on the new normal, preparing capitalism for the 21st century. Um, this is um, a joint event which uh, we're running with uh, St. Paul's Institute, and hugely grateful to St. Paul's Institute for hosting us this evening, and particularly to Rob Gordon. Where's Rob? Um, there, there's Rob. Rob, thank you very much for all your, all your help uh, in putting this together. And also uh, to Gresham College, um, uh, who are here this evening. I can see Barbara and James in the back there. Um, and uh, for me to say that, to introduce myself, I'm Ken Costa. I'm the Gresham Professor of Commerce, but also uh, the Chairman of London Connection. Now, I think uh, for some of you will know, London Connection was announced um, by the Bishop of London uh, at the time of the Occupy uh, Movement's uh, demonstration at the cathedral as part of a debate uh, that we wanted to initiate uh, in terms of taking seriously some of the issues that had been raised. Um, and what we want to do is to broaden that debate and widen it, as indeed we said at the time that we would, uh, to be properly informed of Christian ethics uh, and to find a way of connecting the financial uh, with the ethical, which uh, hence its name. So uh, we want to draw together a, a panel of speakers over a period of time and we'd love you to be involved uh, directly as well. There is a, a website, I'll give it to you, um, uh, there it is, uh, the St Paul's Institute and also the London Connection website. Uh, which you can be to join in and be part of of, of the debate as it as it goes on. Uh, obviously, as we go on over over the time and over the debates and the discussions, we will you know have a broader and uh, a, a balancing of um, of speakers and contributions across our events and across the the, the various interest groups um, as as we go forward. And tonight um, we have. Um, the three um, good friends uh, and three people who really do know uh, the topic very well from different points of view. So I'd like to start by introducing first to, to uh, Ed Newell, uh, who of course used to be here. Uh, Ed is now the sub-dean of Christchurch um, at Oxford, uh, and, when, and he studied um, economics and economic history at, uh, at University College London. Um, and uh, was until recently a member of the Church of England's Ethical Investment Advisory Group and has recently published a book called Ethics in Investment Banking. Make a fascinating topic to read. Ed. I'm looking forward to, uh, to getting hold of that. Um, Lord Way, Nat Way, um, read Modern Languages at Jesus College in Oxford, uh, had a time at McKinsey's, um, was a founding member of the Dynamic Teach First um, organization and a founder partner of the, Sh the Shaftesbury Partnership, uh, a government advisor on the big society, and now the youngest active member of the House of Lords, uh, which he joined um, uh, since last year. When, when was it? Two years ago. Two years ago. And then the thirdly, Paul Marshall, who's chairman of Marshall Waste, which is one of the hedge funds uh, in, in the city, educated St. John's College at Oxford, uh, co-founded Marshall Waste, uh, one of Europe's largest hedge fund groups, um, and also a member of the Hedge Fund Standards Board. Um, Paul has many different parts uh, to his life, including extraordinary work which he does uh, as chairman of ARC, which is um, one of those extraordinary charities which raises a great deal of money from the community for the schools uh, which they founded and academy providers uh, in, in, in the UK and elsewhere. A founder member and still chairs the Liberal Democrat Think Tank Centre Forum and an advisor to Nick Clegg. Um, <coughs> What, uh, I just want to introduce the topic very briefly, and then we will have each one of our speakers make a contribution for a few minutes, and thereafter open to questions and, and answers, and have uh, a debate amongst ourselves. If there are any spare seats, um, could you just indicate it? Any, I see people standing here, a couple here, if you want them. Hold up, thank you. 
So as we are gathered um, here in uh, the Ren Suite in, um, in St. Paul's, I thought it might be appropriate and, of course, do one of the riskiest things, and that is to talk about the Bible. Now, at one of the low points in Israel's early history in the Old Testament, not long after the Exodus, in the book of Numbers, the people of God rebelled against their leaders. The Israelites have only just been delivered from slavery and oppression, but the days in the desert are long and the memories are short. And they find their new situation too difficult to deal with. And so they grumble against Moses and Aaron and lament the passing of their old, unfree life. If only we had died there, they complain. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back, they ask, before concluding we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt? And the scene is all too credible. Indeed, it shows a painfully acute understanding of human psychology, of how quickly we forget what the past, even the immediate past, was really like, of how gratitude can so quickly turn to bitterness, of how we can readily blame our leaders for problems that are often of our own making. I mention this because the story from Numbers 13 offers a perceptive model for where we are today. The financial crisis, which has been immensely costly to the British people, indeed to most uh, Western economies, are still massive problems with sovereign debt. The Eurozone, our economy, like many others, just remains very precariously based. The public, the political, and the financial mood was initially firmly that we cannot go back to the status quo ante. We cannot risk another crisis like that from which we are slowly and painfully crawling free. There is a collective, if unspoken, resolution that we cannot let finance slip its ethical moorings as badly as it did. And yet, like the Israelites, there seems at the same time to be an insidious fear, perhaps even a desire in some quarters to slip back into Egypt, to return to where we were before, business as usual, the old normal, in which bankers who made unmerited millions and the public who despised them for it are locked into some kind of dysfunctional marriage. Now, I've spoken about how I believe this is both an unacceptable and a dangerous uh, practice. In particular, in my last lecture as the Gresham Professor of Commerce, I spoke of how we need to move towards the new normal. The new normal, I argued, meant saying goodbye to banker bashing as if repeatedly blaming the financial sector in its entirety for the crash was some kind of constructive response to the problems before us. But it also meant saying goodbye to morality light capitalism, finance and trading as if the basic ethical standards of everyday life somehow did not apply to the boardroom or to the trading floor. And specifically, I argued argued that the new normal demands three things. First, it demands that we respect the financial aspect of our human nature. We need to acknowledge and to value our inclination to do well and to make every effort to encourage wealth creation as the only way out of our current economic crisis. Secondly, it demands that we recognize the ethical element of our human nature. We need to embed ethical practices, both in regulation, as far as it's appropriate to do so, and in corporate and individual behavior in such a way as to encourage and to enable morally responsible financial activity. And the third, it demands that we release the true human spirit, not only appreciating what the human spirit really is, not the autonomous, rational, welfare maximizing of economic theory, but also the energizing potential of which our humanity is capable. The new normal is, as I've mentioned, the theme for our seminar this evening, and I hope we're going to cover some of these topics and many of the others which uh, you uh, will raise. So let me call on Ed Newell to come and to speak to us as the first contribution.
being a clergyman, I'm going to have a text, but the text uh, isn't from the Bible. Um, it's from that Anna great source, the St. Paul's Institute. And uh, the text is this, Value and Values, Perceptions of Ethics in the City Today, which came out uh, last autumn. And um, I guess being the church representative on the panel is quite a challenge this evening um, if you read this report, because it says that only 24% of the respondents to the questionnaire that it's based on um, believe that uh, the, ch the city needs to listen to the church for uh, any sort of guidance. So that's a challenge. It's a challenge for the projects that, um, that are doing uh, tremendous work uh, within the city at the moment. Um, how does it get out there? How does it engage? I think that's a, a big challenge for us all. But I want to focus on another statistic um, that came out of this report which was that 79% um, of city professionals didn't know the stock exchange's uh, motto, my word is my bond. Now, that's an interesting statistic, and I don't think it's necessarily evidence for any sort of decline in moral standards, but what it is is um, evidence, I think, of a changing uh, understanding of business within the city and beyond. Nor do I think it's necessarily a bad thing that it's not known. Um, the motto, um, my word is my bond, is about um, trust and it's about honesty, but that's all for instilling confidence uh, in the people uh, that you're dealing with. It's not actually about saying uh, a motto about doing good as such. For all I know, Adolf Hitler could have been uh, a man of his word, um, but did he do good? So I think if we're looking at that motto, we have to look at it a bit more in a more sophisticated way. Now, many people have been arguing in the city for a long time that what has been needed is to reinvigorate my word is my bond as uh, a principle that should be operating across the board in the city, and that if that was the case, then uh, the city would be a much better place, a much more ethical place. Well, is that really the case? I would argue that um, for uh, better moral business in the city and beyond, much more is needed than my word is my bond. We need to look at something that's much more sophisticated than that. Perhaps the challenge for good business is to think about the service element uh, within the financial services industry, the service element to serve society at large and not to focus so much on being self-serving. And with that in mind, um, last year, or the year before last now, I was approached by an, uh, an investment banker, John Reynolds, to ask if I would work with him on a book about uh, investment banking. And that was a very interesting exercise because we came from two very different worlds. But strangely, um, the, uh, John Reynolds studied uh, theology uh, at Cambridge and then was told he was a rather aggressive person to go into the church and ended up going into investment banking, and whereas I studied economics, and, I, and pretty much out of my cohort, of, uh, I didn't go into the city, I went into the church, so we sort of uh, crossed in, in this strange, strange way. But working with John was uh, a revelation to me because it really stopped me thinking in a fanciful, uh, abstract way about the issues involved because, uh, of course, uh, he was someone that dealt with issues on a day-to-day -day basis, understood the culture of, of the investment bank in a way that I, ha I hadn't grasped, and made me think very seriously about the reality on the difficulties of putting into place some of the ethical uh, uh, ideas that we were coming up with. But in broad, very broad terms, and it can only really be broad terms in the few minutes we've got this evening, um, there are essentially three main strands of approach to, to ethics. Um, and one of them is, uh, use the technical jargon, deontological ethics, and it's that school of ethics which comes out with moral rules, uh, regulations, moral absolutes, moral imperatives. It tends to be associated with religions, but not necessarily with religion. religion. So someone like Immanuel Kant is a great hero of those people that take that approach. But nevertheless, it says there are certain things which we should hold uh, first and foremost as principles to operate by. The other great school of, of ethics is consequentialist ethics, um, seeking, trying to look at the consequences of, of, of behavior. 
and perhaps the greatest example of this is utilitarianism. And for anyone that studied economics at any level, you would have been immediately immersed in utilitarianism because that is the underlying principle about so much economic theory. So even if you're not thinking about morality and ethics and you're studying economics, you're actually soaking all that in. And, uh, and that's another important school of thought. And then the third school of thought is the whole world of virtue ethics and the idea that if you can instill in individuals um, good moral principles, make them good, uh, good people, then actually that's, that's the key thing because they will naturally behave uh, in a good way and the, and the outworking of, of their behaviour will be for the benefit of all. Now, the tendency, I guess this is gross, a gross simplification, but I think the, the tendency within in the business uh, world has been not to focus on deontological ethics, but to focus more on consequentialism and on more in particular on virtue ethics, which is where uh, my word is my bond, I think, really uh, springs from. And what we were arguing in our book um, is that that is not enough, that actually we need to have a more sophisticated approach to, to ethics, uh, which takes on board the, the responsibilities that firms have to various stakeholders and, and takes on board more deontological principles in the way that, uh, uh, that firms operate. And we started to look at codes of conduct that firms had uh, to see whether that was really the case. And um, what we discovered, and what John in particular was very critical about, uh, was the lack of rigour within many ethical codes that firms were operating by, that, um, that really they didn't put into, into place key core principles which, would, um, which should direct um, the way that firms were operating. But also, one of the things that we, we were focused on, again, I really need John uh, standing behind here rather than me, was the uh, discontinuity between some of the codes of conduct that firms were operating uh, with and the pressures on their staff in terms of behaviour that expected of them in terms of the performance they're required to do. And this, I think, is absolutely crucial to the whole, uh, whole dis discussion. If we're going to uh, raise the moral stakes in business, what's got to happen is there's got to be a high degree of integration between um, the ethics that are being aspired to and the business models that firms are operating by. If there is a discontinuity, then inevitably the ethics will get pushed down. And so this needs to be looked at very, very carefully indeed. Um, can uh, sensible codes of ethics be put in place and can they inform business uh, models? Now, I'm going just to wind, wind up on, on this. Um, I think this is a place where the church can have a role because firms, if they need help in, in dealing with this, can need to look for areas of expertise and the church is one uh, place where it can turn to to find people who've got some expertise in terms of setting the agenda, setting the, uh, the ethical agenda. So my hope is that the new norm for um, business life will be a norm where there, is, uh, there are effective codes of ethics put into place within businesses, where this is backed up by regular training in ethics, and where um, a high degree of expertise is brought in to make sure that these models of ethics are actually rigorous but also workable within firms. And that, I think, is a huge challenge um, within the city uh, and beyond. Thank you. Well, I find myself in the um, surprising position of representing the political perspective tonight. I'm something of an accident, accidental politician, having focused really on social enterprise and social reform over the last decade, only to find myself parachuted in because of my experience. So all I can give you, perhaps, is an outsider's inside perspective on this topic. And it may come as perhaps a surprise for me to say this as someone who's advised the government on the big society and now as a peer in, uh, in Parliament, that I think that politicians at the moment have very little of substance to say about the new normal, for three reasons. Whether you're talking about the big society or the good or open society, the debate, in my view, has really been mostly about power recently, rather than economics. 
either that government should have less of it and people more, uh, one could argue paraphr that's a, a paraphrase of the big society, or that business perhaps should have less and that people should have more with the government's help. Uh, again, perhaps a paraphrase of the good society, or that, forgive me Paul, some people should have less power and some politicians should have more, uh, to uh, cheekily paraphrase an open society approach. Whatever you call it, whether you believe in or understand these terms, this has very limited amount to, to, to uh, contribute uh, in terms of um, the global technotic, tectonic change that is taking place. We're in an era when, uh, uh, with social media and the internet, the people should be more in charge. And to some extent, this shift is happening. Different institutions are coming under the spotlight, whether the media, the police, parliament, Whitehall, the professions, and others which uh, still may yet uh, come to, to be revealed. Any authority, any big institution or person in this age is un now under intense scrutiny as the shift takes place. Because the cost of that scrutiny and of protest itself has significantly fallen, partly due to technology. But that focus on power, which is very much the discussion in the political sphere at the moment, in my view, doesn't have much to do with what Ken has described as the new normal. In my view, the new normal arises out of a, a set of long-term economic shifts which are radically reshaping our financial futures and which will require politicians and others to look at the world very differently from the way they look at it now. And right now, sadly, we politicians don't get it. The debate is still essentially between things like monetarism or Keynesian policy responses between whether we should be issuing more bonds or exiting the euro, between whether we should save the banks or break them up, everything but the main issue, which in my view is the demographic crisis that we face in the West and even in China soon, where I originally come from, which underpins so much of the change that is happening. It's common sense, really. If there were not so many people starting to spend less as their kids got older and working less as they retire, we would have more growth in the future decades to fund our Keynesian and monetarist policies, and less debt would be required to maintain the standards of living we've come to expect in the shadow of the baby boomer gener post-war generation. And we probably have fewer financial crises because in order to maintain the returns that we've been used to over the last 50 years, as people retire and spend and less and pay less, fewer, less taxes, we wouldn't require uh, sort of money to be pumped into the system, which creates systemic risk um, to maintain those, uh, those rates of return. Uh, money to keep the 60-year boom alive in the form of either quantitative easing or low interest rates. The final reason politicians are not engaging with this, this issue of the new normal at the moment. And let's remember in Japan, it took 10 years after the onset of their own aging related spending boom and bust to realize things had changed, that the old economic models might not work uh, uh, in the same way. Uh, it's because we politicians are not only more interested in power uh, and do not yet realize that demographic aging is one of the major root causes of the crisis that we face in the West, but that even if we were focused on this issue and understood the implications, and there are politicians who do know that this crisis, the, you know, the trillion uh, pound off balance sheet deficit, which don't even talk about in Parliament much, uh, we have very limited means to do anything about it. We neither have the money to resource policy change, nor much ability to bring in, for example, young immigrants, which is America's perennial response to the aging population and a source of their centuries long success, not politically popular here. Uh, uh, and a popular climate in which the emphasis is on work and not having more children in stable community environments. In fact, the solution, in part, is to adapt to the reality of what is going to come. Uh, is really the, the domain of others beyond government, people who can act locally and globally, people who can ensure, ensure that in a shrinking and still globalizing economy, more people have access to productive assets, which incidentally is the real meaning of Jubilee, returning the land to people so they can till it for themselves. Uh, rather than relying on their labor to generate increasing wealth, which in an era of globalization isn't going to guarantee uh, rising incomes. People who can help others connect in reciprocal ways 
as the money supply inevitably shrinks to provide mutual forms of support, whether through literally mutuals or cooperatives, such as uh, took place in the 30s, the last time we had a, a shrinking population, or through new methods of collaborative consumption, harnessing technology as advocated by the likes of Rachel Botsman, or in movements and guilds like those which used to determine respectable behaviour in places like the city where we are right now. People who help others discover deep, enduring relationships so that everyone has someone to turn to when emergencies happen, which will increasingly have to happen in this era, in an era which, uh, after which, after an era in which the state was turned to when we had the money in the baby boom to solve almost every problem in our lives. People who campaign for government to foster what I call three economies so that we belong to at least two and thereby become more res resilient. The monetary economy, the reciprocal economy, what we can do for others in a reciprocal way without exchanging money directly, and the unconditional or gift economy, where when we are in our deepest moment of need, others can give us unconditional help and support. And whether we encourage these three economies through tax breaks, for example, for firms, to favour those that are owned by more people rather than just a few, or reforming regulations to make things like peer-to-peer -peer finance or social investment safer <laughs> and less bureaucratic and costly, or simply promoting the kinds of relationships that are unconditional, that do help people in their moment of need. There is a limited amount that politicians can do. In truth, the real agents of change are not politicians, but people like you, people like the social reformers who ran the city hundreds of years ago, Admittedly, at first, often because they're afraid of a French Revolution. Uh, people who led great businesses and built the empire, whilst also developing the cities that we live in. Founding fathers of places like Birmingham and Hong Kong. People who didn't just give to charity or become, say, an MP, but initiated the creations of chains of schools, changed working practices, abolished slavery, improved their welfare, workers' welfare. People who saw that doing good and doing business could be one and the same thing, and that good system design could change society. People who created wealth primarily to give it away. I'm not sure I want to be in a world anymore in the next few decades where we angrily blame each other as leaders in finance, politics, or media as our societies shrink and are told how bad and awful we are in the world of this new normal. I want to see a world instead in which we are all social reformers, building the new normal even as the old one passes. And I'll just sort of end my reflections, because this is all quite sort of high and flighty. But I do believe that for this time, we are going to need a, a different kind of approach to economics. And uh, as I was thinking about speaking today, I recall um, some papers I read about five years ago, which were quite interesting, but which I didn't really understand the true meaning of until recent events. Um, and uh, largely driven by the work of a... Uh, uh, econophysicist in France, Jean-Philippe Bouchot, who also happens to be a hedge fund uh, manager in Paris. He uh, was doing some research into the way that glass condenses, so very unrelated to almost anything we're talking about right now, and discovered um, through doing some agent-based modeling, so it's very kind of supercomputer type stuff, uh, curves that look very familiar, very similar to uh, inequality curves, the Gini coefficient and all of that. So he was actually able to derive from his computer models some of the drivers of inequality in society. So he set up models that simulated a 1,000 people having money, the same amount of money, trading, getting random returns on their investments, and saw these curves emerging that we're familiar with, but that we know how they occur, and learned several things which I think are very interesting to, to debate today's debate. First is that the process of inequality increasing accelerates over time. As some get richer, some get poorer, the richer have more to invest, the poorer have less to invest, and so all things being equal on an average basis. And you saw that there comes a moment when the acceleration snaps, he called it la rupture, and you arrive at a situation where sort of Marie Antoinette, one person has everything and everybody else has nothing, which is a source of revolution, rioting, etc. So his computer models are saying that that is an inevitability. And I think the biblical practice, which was never really installed of Jubilee, was about creating a breakage, a reset, if you like, to avoid that natural process happening, physical process happening. Secondly, he found that left and right are both half right and half wrong. 
if you redistribute, it doesn't actually change the, the process. You know, you, it just continues to happen of, of uh, condensation of wealth. Equally, if you try and speed up the economy, which is a kind of a right-wing approach, it just makes it happen faster. Um, what was really interesting is that um, the thing that you can do is connect people who have different levels of wealth with each other and encourage them to trade with each other, rich and poor, rather than rich with rich or poor just with poor. And of course, if you think about social reform, the process of getting wealthy people to give or trade with people who have less means than themselves and create institutions and cooperatives and all kinds of mechanisms that enable that transfer and enable those who don't have that much to risk a little bit more so they can make a bit more or those that have a lot to not just trade with those who can give them the best price, but trade and give a whole host of other reasons, then that actually might give us some insight into the way forward. In a networked global economy, can we use tools such as econophysics uh, to find new ways to create institutions and solutions, the kind that we need to create a, a fairer world where private, public and voluntary work together to create solutions in the world of the new normal. I think we need a world where we need more thinking like this, the thinking that actually powers some of the best hedge funds, ironically, but applied to social problems. And to, alongside the tools, we need people, people who are in this room, people who run the institutions that power the world, to see themselves no longer as just perhaps through a little bit of charity here or, or a good speech there, you know, able to... Um, discharge their responsibilities, who are actually see themselves as social reformers, just as Cadbury did, just as the leaders of the abolition movement did, who actually see themselves as driving the solutions rather than uh, part of the problem or sort of bystanders. And finally, I think we need to see firms who have amazing resources. I have nothing against large banks or organisations or, or big charities, as sometimes people claim that I have. But I do wish sometimes they'd use their amazing resources, their ability to scale, and use them to help what's working in the new normal and the old normal to scale up as well, whether there's educational or health or other solutions. Big firms, banks have the ability to take great small local pilots and bring them to millions of people around the world. And I think there's an opportunity for us to join together to develop the tools, the kinds of people and the kinds of firms that can create that new normal. In conclusion, the new normal will not come in a top-down fashion, but bottom-up, not from politicians, but from people who see themselves as social reformers. And we have the opportunity to take what's working, to design it for scale, to spread it, and bring about and be the change we want to see in the world before it is too late. Protest, yes, has its place. But I think real solutions to the crisis we faced that are practical and scalable are the best response to what is happening. And we do not need to wait for government or politicians to, to make a start in creating that new normal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. As a hedge fund manager, I would expect that you expect that my contribution will be the one which is most read in tooth and claw about markets, pro-markets, uh, pro the financial sector. Uh, I, I will disappoint you on that, if that's your expectation. I will try and be read in tooth and claw in terms of being disruptive. Uh, and I want to be disruptive slightly to the thesis about new normal. Because if, we're any, if we think we're close to the new normal, then we're making a big mistake, because I think that the response to the crisis has been highly inadequate uh, and that we've not really begun to address the root cause of the crisis, which is the overweening size uh, and power of the banking sector. And, uh, and therefore, I challenge the notion of new normal, because I don't think we're there yet. And therefore, and I also am afraid, Ken, I am going to do some bank bashing, not banker bashing, but I'm going to a bank, a bash the banks to a certain degree. Having said all that, I am pro-markets. Uh, uh, I do not believe that capitalism's failure is inevitable, and most of the tools for tackling capitalism's failings already exist. 
Most of the problems we've experienced in the last 15 years have occurred because we ignored them. Uh, making capitalism work is not rocket science. It requires a basic understanding of three things, in my view. One, the limitation of markets. Two, the limitations of human nature. And three, the limitations of classical economic theory. I'm going to concentrate today on these three sets of limitations and th suggest three sources of wisdom uh, to help us dealing with them and making capitalism fit for the 21st century. The first two sets of wisdom already exist and we basically just ignored them. The third is a work in progress. My first source of wisdom dates back to 1958, which was the first time that the profession of microeconomics started talking about market failures. The study of market failures is a branch of microeconomics. It sounds very dry, but it actually provides a framework for understanding almost all of the failings of capitalism. And more importantly, it provides a framework for allowing to politicians to intervene in markets appropriately and rationally, sometimes something that they systematically fail to do. Uh, I'm not going to go through, there are, there are between half a dozen and a dozen market failures in the textbooks, and I'm not going to go through the list. I just want to give you a few examples in terms of their relevance. First example is information asymmetry. Again, sounds very uh, dry, but actually it just describes the process where a seller of a product knows more about it than the buyer. Uh, information asymmetry exists in large numbers of products in a knowledge-based world. In the health sector, most governments think Rightly, in my view, that the consequences of the information asymmetry are such that you should not allow the private sector to control the whole provision of health because of the risk to the patient. Uh, in, the, in the financial sector and in the legal profession, I would say that information asymmetry exists for 99% of all products. And therefore, they need very careful regulation. You have, as a result of that, what people sometimes refer to as the conspiracy of the laity the conspiracy of the seller against the buyer. And for that reason, the FSA regulates effectively all the, all the sale of financial products to the retail world. It doesn't regulate professional to professional selling of a product. So you, uh, when Goldman Sachs sold um, CDOs to German Landers banks, uh, they, 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 their view was that it was professional to professional and therefore didn't need regulation. That may be true technically and legally. You can make your own judgments about the morality of it. Um, second type of uh, uh, market failure, externalities. That another word for basically the unintended consequence of market forces. So, I mean, the most obvious application is, is in uh, actually in the world of material resources, uh, where if you, ex if, you if you use too much of the resource, you deplete it, and, and therefore there's nothing left for future generations. Again, it's an area where government needs to intervene. Uh, another example of uh, externality is financial stability. If you allow banks to become too big and too leveraged, you create a massive externality uh, called financial instability, which, meet, which all of the taxpayers end up having to pick up, which is exactly what we did uh, in the last 20 years. A third example of market failure is the, what people call the agency problem, which is a grand word for conflict of interest. Uh, in terms of conflicts of interest, when Goldman Sachs pays Moody's to rate their debt, or the government of Spain pays Moody's to rate their debt, that is a conflict of interest. It hasn't been dealt with. When uh, fund managers are expected to vote on the corporate governance on the corporate governance of a company, and they all of the, all of the fund managers in the institutional world are hoping to win mandates from the same such companies, they have a conflict of interest. It hasn't been dealt with. Uh, the fourth and final example of market failure I just want to mention is the most important, which is imperfect competition, and that's the market failure which Karl Marx pre uh, predicted would end up causing the collapse of the capitalist system. All companies have a tendency to monopoly power uh, and to distorting competition. Governments do a pretty good job of trying to regulate monopolies, although uh, you still end up in uh, BAA is, for example, regulated as a monopoly, but you still end up trapped in a shopping centre when all you only do is, is catch a plane. And that, so that's an example of ineffective regulation of a, of a monopoly, in my view, which is one that particularly irritates me. <laughs> um, the, uh, but more importantly than that, um, 
The financial sector has a problem, which has become much too big. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt was known as the trust buster for taking on the huge energy and railroad monopolies of his day, and he was right to do so. And today, governments face a similar challenge with the banking sector, both in the US and in Europe, particularly in the US, but continental Europe is actually has just as much of an issue. Um, and uh, they have become too big and powerful, partly because of their lobbying power. They, sp they spent over a billion dollars on lobbying in the last three years in the United States, and partly because of the too big to fail problem. For me, the United States today it resembles medieval, uh, or not medieval, uh, 16th, 17th century Florence or Venice. It's essentially a financial oligarchy, uh, uh, and where there are many rivals for the crown of the Medicis. <laughs> But the one who takes the biscuit is Hank Paulson. Uh, he, he, he led the campaign to repeal the net leverage rule, which was the single prime cause of the extent of the financial collapse in the United States. Uh, three or four years later, he became financial secretary to the Treasury. He then led the bailout of AIG, who in turn repaid Goldman Sachs 100 cents on the dollar for their exposures to AIG. The United States uh, is still run for the financial sector. Barack Obama, in my view, had a great opportunity and a mandate to take on uh, the financial sector. And I don't understand why he's done it, because I think it would have been good politics to do so, but he hasn't done so. So many of the, of the things that led to the failures still exist, including the net leverage rule, no, the, la the, the absence of a leverage rule, including the uh, absence of regulation of the uh, derivatives market. Uh, and including the uh, lack of regulation of the rating agencies. So uh, the basically, particularly in the United States, but I would have to say in France, uh, the, 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 financial, the, the financial economy is run for the benefit of the banks. In Spain, it's been, it's been the case. Uh, in, most, in most economies, uh, that is the case. And so we just have not dealt uh, with the biggest single market failure, which is the, the problem of the banks at the moment. My second pillar, uh, which we've uh, ignored, is, is the Judeo-Christian religion. The development of capitalism was highly influenced, as we all know, by the values and structures of, of, of Judeo-Christian culture from which it emerged. It could arguably not have, emerged, have emerged without the framework of property rights, the respect for wealth creation, hard work, and the fulfillment of talents, which runs throughout the Old and the New Testaments. Capitalism would certainly not have emerged from Islam, which has produced nothing but 1,500 years of economic turpitude. Max Weber went more narrow than, than I've done, and, and specifically linked the emergence of capitalism to the Protestant faith uh, because of its emphasis on the idea of worldly calling and the Protestant work ethic. I would not go as narrow as, as Weber, but I would go further than him because I think that the continuity of a Judeo-Christian framework and perhaps in particular, its understanding of the limitations of human nature and the importance of virtue is critical to the survival and effectiveness of capitalism. In the 1988 film Wall Street, Norman Stone had Gordon Gekko make a powerful speech about the qualities of greed. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed is good. Greed is right. Greed clarifies. Greed works. Greed cuts through and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all its forms, greed for life, for money, for love, for knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. To Norman Stone's horror, the speech did not so much cement people's distrust of Wall Street as create a cult for Gordon Gecko, which inspired a whole generation of traders. And before we confine this to Wall Street, let us remember that the financial system is in most respects the manifestation of the hold has, that greed has taken on all of Western society. Our society has lost the values that provided the architecture for the first incarnation of, of capitalism in the 16th and 17th century. People have borrowed too much money. We live beyond our means. This is, relates to what Nat was saying about demographics as well. And our stomachs are bigger than our wallets. The values of contemporary society are in a very different place from Protestant Europe of Weber's uh, day. I'm not being totally nostalgic. I know there were problems then too, but in relation to, these, to the, the, found, the building blocks of capitalism. And this will make it, make it much more difficult to build a sustainable capitalism. The loss of the Judeo-Christian framework is perhaps best incarnated by Alan Greenspan. 
the ringmaster of the bubble years. In his younger, year, younger days, Alan Greenspan used to literally sit at the feet of Ayn Rand, a refugee from communist Europe, who was by her own defini definition a rational objectivist. What that meant was she advocated reason as the only means of acquiring knowledge and re rejected all forms of faith and religion. She believed that man was supremely rational and moreover that he was on a path to perfectibility. This deep human arrogance is the opposite of Christianity. Her disciple, Greenspan, made repeated mistakes in the regulation of financial markets, largely based on his underestimation of the human capacity for error. Having made these great claims for the Judeo-Christian faith, I have to acknowledge that the response of the church to the financial crisis has been distinctly mixed. And I obviously exempt the, uh, the, the Honorable Company and St. Paul's Institute and, and the work that Ken's doing. But I have to say that I think the response of the Church of England has been poor, largely because neither of the two archbishops have any intuitive or practical understanding of markets. In contrast, the Catholic Church, and in particular Pope Benedict, in his recent encyclical, Caritas in Veritate, has been nothing short of inspiring. I recommend that any of you who are looking for a pathway for the future of cap capitalism, if you have not already done so, read Caritas in Veritate. Its message is simple. Markets can be can, cannot be regarded as morally neutral. The economy needs ethics if it is to function properly. Profit cannot be considered the sole purpose of economic activity. People and companies have a responsibility towards the common good. And for markets and capitalisms to work effectively, we need to be able to rely on character and virtue. This leads me to the third pillar. And this is unfortunately a pillar which needs to be built or rebuilt. And that is our understanding of economics. For just as Alan Greenspan sought to regulate markets based on a false understanding of human nature, so the science, quote unquote, of economics is built on a set of assumptions about the operation of markets and of human nature which are intrinsically false. Classical, uh, Nat mentioned the French physicist. Be, be, be very careful with all French physicists. <laughs> Uh, classical economics originated with an obscure French physicist called Leon Valrus, Valrus, who imported the simplifying assumptions of Newtonian physics in order to design a structure for making and thinking about markets and economics, economics straightforward. In particular, he assumed, and this was the central assumption, that markets always tended towards equilibrium. Later, other economists in introduced a simplifying assumption that human beings, i.e. market participants, would always act rationally. <laughs> All economic models, classical models, are built on these uh, assumptions. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Markets do not always tend to equilibria, and human beings do not act always rationally. The, the most, probably the most successful and renowned hedge fund manager, George Soros, believes this passionately and has written many books on the subject and has tried to make inroads on the economic profession and it, with very little success because they don't like, they don't like the, the consequences of what he's saying. But essentially anybody who works in markets, and I see some people in the audience who do, knows this, that markets are, are not, do not tend to equilibrium and they're not, and participants are not rational. The problem is the whole edifice, edifice of economics and finance is built on these assumptions. Um, there, there is some evidence of a new generation of economists who are seeking to root the profession more clearly in the real world, particularly the school of what's called imperfect knowledge economics. But so far, change is only at the margin. The detachment of economics from the real world matters for two reasons. First, econo economists are influential. Milton Friedman's theories may have been dismissed by some as voodoo economics, but the market fundamentalism which he spawned gained far too much ascendancy over the political establishments on both sides of the Atlantic during the 80s and 90s and paved the way for the financial crisis of 2008. Secondly, the simplifying models of the economist profession 
have become deeply embedded in the world of finance, spawning models which underlie most derivatives trading. Layer upon layer of financial trading is built upon assumptions based on normal distribution and human rationality. These assumptions are false. As we saw three weeks ago with the London Whale, they can quickly unravel. This means, in essence, that instability is, is built into our financial system. So my prescription for 21st century capitalism is to build itself on three pillars of wisdom. Two of them, the understanding of the nature of market failure and the lessons from the Judeo-Christian understanding of human nature, have existed for many years. The third, our understanding of economics, needs to be rebuilt. You could have sub I could have subtitled what I was saying today, Know Your Limitations. If we understand, but only if we understand, the limitations to markets, the limitations to human nature, and the limitations to economics, will we have chance, a chance of rebuilding capitalism. Well, thank, thank you very much, for Paul, for... Uh, for that contribution and for challenging the, the basic assumption of, um, of, of the evening. Nothing like starting with, uh, with an undermining um, of, uh, of, of the topic, um, but done uh, so, so well with, and so thought-provoking. Uh, as I'm sure you'd want us to say the same with Ed and, and Nat, um, that we have, we have seen a very wide um, a breadth just in those few minutes of so many of the issues that, that we need to grapple with, not only at that first level, but also you know, going much deeper. And of course they were in headline form and I kept writing and hoping to find out more, which I'm sure is exactly what we're going to be doing next. So I'd like to invite you to um, ask any questions of, of any of the panelists, to make a comment, if you'd keep them brief, uh, if it is a comment, um, and uh, let's, let us see wh where we can take uh, these various strands and maybe even arrive at the synthesis at the end. I'm wondering whether I actually might bounce it towards Ken. Because I, what I'd be very interested to, 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 to pick up is the, the changing, if, we, if one looks at specifically the city, um, Clearly, the city has, has changed remarkably since the Big Bang in terms of scale uh, and, and scope of what um, uh, firms are, are involved in. And I guess um, you will, Ken will observe when of, of the old type of city and the nature of the way that, that, that firms might have been able to work when they were much more tightly controlling what they could actually do and they were physically much smaller in terms of staff compared with now. There's huge, with vast turnovers of staff and, you know, Communication yeah. must be incredibly difficult, and I wonder whether whether you might have any. Well, I, I'm, I'm very happy to, but um, one of the nice things about passing balls all over <laughs> is I, I was very struck when when Nat was talking about the um, about scaling and scale, and and it, it, of course the, the, they operate at two levels. You know, the one is the city and globalization were running together with Big Bang and all of that at that time, and they became big, and, and we have all the, the issues that Paul has raised with it. But I think the question that you're addressing is not really at that, uh, at that macro level, but how, um, how it can operate um, at, at, a, at a grassroots level, because it's the bottom up from which we're going to have to build. And that's had some really good experience now. I'm just thinking of how your own charity started. Do you want to just... Before I try and summarise it, give us... It's great to be the re recipient of a double bounce. <laughs> um, tempted to bounce it one more time, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that, um, you know, we, there was a, there's a fundamental shift that happened over the last, say, 20, 30 years in particular. Um, and where partly everything that has been said tonight all coalesced. And when, say, in the 1930s, it was cheap to run a building society or a mutual in your community. Today, I remember conversations in Whitehall, we talked about, should we have regional banks? And of course, everybody then turns around and goes, well, okay, how many people will we have to hire? How much do we have to pay them? And at today's prices, setting up a bank in Manchester, even a bank, not even a building society, doesn't make economic sense. 
because they all need bonuses and etc. So something happened where running a bu building society in a mutual at a certain scale was no longer a sensible economic decision or, or sustainable decision. And that's the point at which when somebody comes to you with money or the op opportunity to demutualize, you, you, you do that. And at that point, you're on the path to what we've seen uh, you know, culminating in 2008, etc. cetera. Um, what I think interesting is we're starting to see the emergence of ways of running financial um, uh, organizations that look like mutuals, particularly peer-to-peer, -peer, that if they develop on a certain path, could lower the cost of providing certain financial services which are available to ordinary people, which do start to build what looks like trust in localities with you and your network. It may not be a geographical thing, but maybe more a relational thing, literally as in you know, LinkedIn or, or, or Facebook. Uh, and I think that could start to bring that back. But if you're in an era where you don't have those tools to you know, effectively lend to somebody else who someone you know knows, use the internet and so on to gather data that you wouldn't otherwise have got. If you have to centralize that data, process it, do the credit storing somewhere halfway around the world at a certain cost, then you're, you know, you've got nowhere to turn. And at that point, bigger, biggest best wins. Um, and that's partly why we're here, if that makes yeah. sense. Thank you. Paul, do you want to... I, I, I agree with you. The biggest issue is um, the, the race to the bottom issue. I mean, the, the reason why the Americans... Um, Paul, can you speak sorry, up? The, the reason the Americans repealed the leverage rule was because the European banks were much more levered and they felt they needed to compete. And, 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 and there's been an inability to, at the government level, to agree a set of global standards. You mentioned that I was on, uh, on the head, was instrumental in setting up the hedge fund standards board. We were, we were able to agree with all hedge funds in all regions of the world uh, a set of standards which applied, should apply to our industry. But politicians have a much more difficult job because they have so many constituents to work. So people who are in the industry find it e easier to, to agree, although I don't necessarily on leverage, I'm not sure they would. But so the, but I agree with you completely that the, the lack of willingness to, 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 to work together globally is probably the single biggest issue. Um, I, I, think there are, I, mean, I, I think there are a number of things that, that, that they should do, like have a common leverage rule, like uh, global regulation of derivatives, uh, um, like proper re regulation of the rating agencies, as I mentioned. I don't, just in passing, think the Tobin tax is a good idea for the simple reason that the Tobin tax is a tax on savers. You're not taxing banks, you're taxing savers. You're, pe you're taxing the people whose money is being invested. Uh, and and all, the, all of the costs are passed on to the savers. So it, it's an incredibly convenient tax for people to talk about because it, it, it looks easy to raise, but it's actually an ill-directed tax. If you want to tax banks... Sorry? Yes. Well, maybe, maybe we won't for this. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll get down a very technical area if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you. Uh, role of the state, uh, I think life is much more complex now than when the welfare state was set up. And there are a lot of challenges that it's very hard for government to solve. Most of the problems that we, could so we thought we could solve after the war were fairly rational. It was the, it's the heyday of modernism and we can cure polio, which we did, we can create a free healthcare system, pensions, etc. How do you cure obesity? How do you cure low aspirations in schools? How do you cure people wanting lots of debt, buying mortgages and, and uh, have credit cards to buy things that perhaps they don't really need? These are very difficult things for governments to solve because they're to do with social behavior. They can try and regulate them, but at the end of the day, you've got to go down to the root cause. What is it that individuals, the choices that they're making, the, re the rationality that isn't necessarily r rational in a modernist sense, but rational to them. Uh, that's much more difficult to, to address because it's very micro. You know, the reason why people weren't from top universities wanting to become 
teachers in inner city schools 10 years ago was a very particular reason which the, the government of the day of whatever colour had no idea how to address. Uh, it taught people from outside the system to, to address that. And I think actually that's this return back to the norm, the new normal, the old, the old new normal. Uh, because government has always been changed by, from mainly outside. Uh, I, I always like to use the analogy of DNA. Most of our DNA is viruses that infected us and then became part of our DNA. Um, much of the government state infrastructure was developed by philanthropists and social entrepreneurs, if you like, our cities, our health system, our schools, and then were co-opted by the government when they got to a certain scale. Um, and I think that's the way you can need to continue to drive improvement in the state in, in the future. Uh, well, I, I completely agree with the, with the thrust of the question. I think I actually think you, I, to be gross, to grossly simplify, there are only two problems. Broadly, most of capitalism has not failed. Uh, it, it, industrial capitalism, the service economy, those kinds of companies continue to do a good job serving their clients and so on and so forth. We have two problems. One is the failure of the banking system. And the second is the, the failure and the end of the welfare state because of or the, the, the pressure due to the issues that Matt raised around demographics. And the, the, the great misfortune for political debate was that 2008 happened at a time when we were already heading towards the crisis of the welfare state and everybody's blamed all of the problems on the financial crisis. And actually there are two problems happening at once. And the, the failure of the welfare state we're now see is is one of the primary reasons, not the only reason for the, for the whole European saga. Uh, and, and so society is, there, there's a complete, therefore, absence of political leadership because it's extremely convenient for politicians to blame just the markets rather than deal with the welfare state problem. Uh, in terms of the failure of banking, and I, and I think it is very specifically banking, I think the, <coughs> the heart of the problem for me is the banking system is essentially underwritten by the taxpayer. If the system is underwritten by the taxpayer, it cannot operate like other parts of the capitalist economy. It cannot have the same freedoms. Uh, and, uh, and it ultimately has to be a servant uh, of the economy in a structural way. If you look at both the US and China, the banking system, or not, in the US, half of the banking system is state controlled. This is the kind of, the, the great, paradox in the US. So we've got the private sector, which is just egregious, or, or, the, or the investment banking side, and then you've got over 50% is in, is in is Freddie, Ma Freddie, Ma Freddie, Ma Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and 85% of all lending since the crisis has gone through the state sector. So they basically use the state sector to, to, to rekindle lending in their economy. So they operate Chinese banking in the US. In the Europe, we just rely on, continuing to rely on, essentially a private sector institutions underwritten by the taxpayer. So we've not we, we, we've got the worst of all worlds. Uh, so, but I think therefore we have to just uh, these are the two issues, and, and politicians have to have to have the courage to speak about these two issues very very clearly. If I can just add, I I, I don't think they're separate. Yeah. My, you know, I've always felt that as the population ages and people after about forty five spend less money because their kids have gone, and they just don't have to buy you know lots of family sized packs of things anymore or whatever. Um, that la naturally dampens growth and if you are someone selling uh, stocks and shares and promising 8% returns every year and suddenly you're getting 6 where do you get that extra 2? So, and if your friend is a central banker who can pump some money into the system you can get that extra 2 for a few years and then it all falls down so we share the blame in a sense that we live in a society that inevitably was going to grow less because we had fewer children or we don't want to welcome the stranger in the land uh, and as a result, we then have to use this method, which lasts for only so long. And, and, and there, there are cycles. This has happened throughout history. I will say, in terms of politicians, um, it's difficult because we've had 60 years of one system, one mindset, very hard to shift. We can see it in Europe now. You know, people don't want... And even here, we're not really reducing the deficit, and yet we felt we've had so much pain. And there is pain. Um, so I think for politicians it's very difficult. I mean, there are lots of analogies here. I mean, the, the, what we are seeing is almost equipped in Europe is almost what they saw a few hundred years ago, the revolution. And we and the elite are having to figure out, okay, do we want to change the system 
or are we going to just let that happen, which it will, as things continue to, to condense? And the system, this, it is as, as pervasive as slavery was, if you like, in the economy of this country and of, of the empire. So, and to change it will take the same degree of energy over the same number of years as probably slavery. It's a different kind of slavery, slavery to a, a certain financial model for people's lives. I mean, the fact that we're having to look back to these role models kind of is the answer because there are, you, otherwise, I'm sure we'd prefer to talk about the dozen people who we can see as role models today around us. Who, I mean, there are a small number, uh, but um, there, are not, there are not enough. Um, and, uh, and, 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 there, and the governance uh, of companies which has been raised by the people uh, it leaves a lot to be desired in many in many in many places, um, where businesses have grown too big and, and there isn't the same tradition of paternalism. So I, I mean, and there isn't the room for the paternalism because the route for a company is to go on the market, cash out. Mm. Uh, you don't get the, the tradition. You get much more in Germany, although it's not necessarily a Christian tradition. But there's much more tradition there of family companies going through uh, generations and actually caring about the staff and so on and creating a community. That, that exists much more strongly in Germany. I, I wouldn't necessarily say it. it's because of their particular faith, but it's more to do with the way they built their society and, and something has remained more robust. In, in our country, you can count on one hand, fingers of one hand, the companies that have stayed in a, in a single generation and not listed on the stock market and cash, not cashed out. So the cashing out problem is a big, a big issue. Hey, did you, you want to I would, no, I was just going to agree. I mean, I think that's the way that, that, that businesses are structured now. Is it makes that sort of model so so difficult to to have. And uh, I share those heroes as well. And uh, uh, look at the switch from family firms to corporate capitalism, and, and the natural consequences of that in terms of making it harder to 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 really um, put values into the boardroom. I think it's a big big challenge. at the time, a kind of laboratory. And it came at a time when actually the issues that were being raised with what I call the informal sector um, had to be heard by those operating in the formal sector, within the city and, uh, and, and, and other organisations. And what was so interesting was that many of the same questions were being raised across the board. Something had gone completely wrong. That which the capitalism had either slipped its moorings and that was either capable of being <coughs> brought back or not at all. And out of that grew a dialogue. We had some meetings um, in the city with Hector Sands of the FSA uh, and others. And this dialogue, just the London Connection, the websites, and all of that, is now a, one of the principal ways of trying to stay in touch and to redirect the debate um, in a way in which. These issues now can be can be raised as we have this evening to try and find you know, what is the way forward. Interesting or fascinating as the analysis is what went wrong because we've got to do that or what the next step is. How do we help each other to create both at the grassroots and through policy and political pressure uh, a way that would you know enable the the the, um, the, 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 the next 20, 50 years or whatever it is to be. Uh, set um, in a direction we would want to um, to subscribe to. We have a gold standard in Europe. It's called the Eurozone, and uh, because essentially they are trying to they're trying to fix all currencies to one value. That is an absolute catastrophe. I mean, it is rather alarming when you think about it. You go back to 1933, literally this month, with the failure of the, of the Kreditanstalt Bank, uh, the immediate leaving of uh, the Germany left the gold standard about two months later, and we followed in September. Um, 
it's an ear it's an eerie rerun um, because you know if um, if you can't maintain in a gold standard which sounds you know the great would everybody be disciplined enough to be able to keep to those rigors and the answer is human nature governments political banks whatever just can't do it and so we have that that prospect right in our in in our midst uh, with the consequences we know not exactly how or what would what would happen let's hope it doesn't repeat ourselves Yes, I mean, I, I would very. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think the role of shareholders is, is phenomenally important, and um, is, um, thinking about particularly um, learning the lessons from being on the ethical investment advisory group uh, for the Church of England, and um, recognizing that actually what one can do in um, in that position is to is to use your uh, shareholding. To, to really to, to raise issues at a pretty uh, high level. What we found with the, with the Church of England's group was um, that although we may not have been the biggest investors, actually we were listened to um, and you could get in and have boardroom uh, discussions with people um, if, you, if you kept hold of your shares and didn't disinvest but actually went in and, and talked, uh, and talked to, to, to firms. And I think this is really very important indeed now. I think also that shareholders need to be saying things about the relative amount of, of take that they're getting compared with, uh, with the remuneration within firms. And I think that is a, is a big issue as well. Certainly it's a big issue within the investment banking sector. So, so that I think shareholders need to be, uh, to, to be, to, to be really uh, using their clout. I think that's going to be part of the, of the norm, actually. It should be. I, I mean, I, I think, I think um, the thrust of what I was saying, I don't think, was really about government in the sense of the civil service or the infrastructure of government. I think I'm talking more, more about politics. No, I'm, th I'm talking more about politics uh, and the way the kind of political situation we're in. You know, we're on the verge of a, uh, well, sort of middle, middle income gerontocracy trap. Japan is right already towards the end of theirs, <laughs> um, when so many people are used to a certain level of living and government doing so much, and most of those people are near retirement or about to retire, mm. then if you're not them, what can government do for you, even if the civil servants want to help you? They can't, because the minister will get fired if they don't serve the needs of the majority. I mean, Shaftesbury, my great hero, was lamented the fact that Bizarrely, you know, it seems weird. The franchise was extended beyond the landed aristocracy. I don't particularly subscribe to that view, but he could see, he could foretell, one day, certain things, certain values would not be popular, and, and therefore things would happen. Um, I think that uh, your point about um, communities, again, communities have changed, and I don't think most people in the country want to go back to say the 1950s model of very tightly knit societies but lots of racism, lots of closeness to the world. But I don't think we necessarily then conclude that we can't create community. It's just a different kind of community facilitated in a different way. Um, and I think the kinds of communities where people have a certain set of very close relationships and then others which are much more sort of open acquaintances. You know, we all know mo most people get jobs through not their closest friends but through people they, who know people. Um, and then the, the market. I just think too often we're, we're only in one of these economies, if you like. And when that economy fails, when the monetary system fails, or when that tight-knit group of friends turns on you or prevents you from advancing, like in a gang, you know, stops you from pursuing your educational dreams, um, or when that network somehow fails because the industry that it's part of is failing, and you're only in one of those, you're in, you're in trouble. And I think if you survey most people in this country, what's happened over the last few decades is, is we have narrowed our dependence on one of these networks, if you like. And that's made us very vulnerable when the inevitable happens. Whereas if we had had preserved, spent a bit more time as individuals, as government, as whoever, thinking about how we preserve these networks, we'd maybe not be all quite in quite the hole that we're in.
I think one area we need to look at very seriously are the different um, shades of, of capitalism that exist around the world. And I guess we've, we've been um, influenced greatly by a um, particular form of North American uh, model of capitalism. There are others, and the Scandinavian models, which I think um, offer a rather different uh, nuance to, to, to some of the issues we've been discussing. But what I think is particularly interesting is now the um, looking towards, um, from our perspective, towards the, the, the East and thinking about the rise of China, of India, and play countries where different cultural values are clearly um, meshing with, with, with capitalism. Uh, and you know, at a relatively early stage, and I think we might discover some, some very important lessons out of that because um, in, in rather different cultures than the one we've got, we may find ways of, of actually uh, operating in, in a different way in a capitalist system. I think you've, you've, you've gone down the, a really very uh, important but difficult route um, is how one has influence and how one gets listened to uh, and how one builds up trust and relationships. Um, one of the things that's, that I was doing when I was here at St Paul's was spending a lot of time quietly having conversations around the city hoping um, that you can, you can sort of get, you can get your foot in the door as it were and then have have meaningful conversations uh, and, and, and try to make connections and get people of influence uh, listened to. It's a hard, hard job, increasingly difficult to do that. Um, you're, we're not, perhaps, haven't got the, um, the, the networks that we may have had a generation ago, within, certainly within the, within the city, you know, the, the links between firms and their local church, that sort of thing has, uh, has, has, got, has, has largely gone. So it's a big, big challenge. I think we need to turn to our leaders in the church. Uh, we need to look to, to people um, in, in different walks of life, non-stipendary ministers who've got in, who are in the workplace. I think we just have to, think, have to think really broadly about it. Where are the connections within the church? How can we use them? How can we uh, and articulate uh, uh, things to firms through those, through those connections and networks? It's a big, big challenge. Um, I'd much prefer to answer your second question uh, and, and, and because I think it is such an important issue now which is that, that basically we live in an increasingly secularised world and therefore people do not have a common framework of values and therefore all you can do I think as a Christian I think for those who are in the room of Christians is to stand up for, to affirm those values but clearly you cannot affirm those values in a political, you can't say we, we, we should be imposing these values. All you can do it is in the context of your own workplace. But, but, but it's extremely difficult, precisely because society does not have a framework that it, can, that it necessarily can agree on, to agree a common set of values as opposed to, as you say, rules. Uh, and, and I think that's particularly true now, well, the US is more of a Christian society, but it's also much more rules-based in the way they operate. So. I think we um, need to draw this fascinating... Um, it's gone, time has gone by so quickly. It's been a fascinating series of discussions. The questions just show the, the, um, the, the level of interest um, that people have in, in this topic. So what I'd really like uh, to encourage you to do is actually to carry on this debate, as we couldn't do. There are many questions here. I'm sure that our panelists will hit the website. Um, and if you direct uh, any of the questions there or make a comment there on, on the website, the purpose of it is to be able to try and find um, the ways in which we can stimulate these discussions and continue them, with, and any suggestions that you might have as to how we might take that forward, uh, if you head it in the, in the same direction, uh, we would be uh, very, uh, very grateful for that and be able to work on it for what might be you know, the next, uh, next instalment. We come to the end now, but uh, we're going to have uh, drinks outside there. I really urge you to stay, if, if you can, for some time. Um, because it's very important that we carry on these discussions in personal contact, meeting new people, uh, having, uh, you know, debating them in a more informal and relaxed way, and also uh, with uh, with our panelists. 
just like at the end to say thank you very much to Benji Williams, who's been uh, helping pull this together for us, uh, and to our panellists, who have been both thoughtful um, and provocative. Um, and uh, we have been really had a rich time listening to the questions that you've raised for us, but also to your boldness in trying to grapple with some of the answers or pointing a way into which and the areas in which we might fruitfully can continue our debate and discussion uh, and hopefully come out of this uh, with um, a movement that could easily start from a group like this, the asking those questions but also coming up with some of the solutions uh, that will be heeded uh, by those who have the power to to influence uh, um, the changes that we all long for. So thank you very much to, to everyone who's, uh, who's, who's come this evening and to uh, our panellists. <laughs>